Welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm Ken Williams, the senior eldest instructor, full-time instructor at Chabot College for Economics. It has been my pleasure to work with Mr. Martin Medeiros, economic professor adjunct at Chabot College, who has worked very, very assiduously to help us produce collectively a series on the, that we present on the Canvas Hub the presentation interview of people who work in the field, either directly or indirectly, with economics. Um, the first two interviews, perhaps not put in order, will be Martin interviewing me as an economist, and secondly, me interviewing Martin about our experiences, how we got into economics. We hope this may pick your interest in a way that textbooks by themselves cannot necessarily do. Sure, that was a great introduction. And I just want to say that it's kind of a pleasure and honor for me to do this because um, many people don't know this, but Ken Williams was my very first economics instructor at <clears throat> Bo. So it's kind of a, a lifelong journey to go from the classroom uh, at Chabot to uh, interviewing him here uh, many, what was just about two years ago, was it? No. <laughs> it, was a few, it was a few years ago. Longer than I want to wish for. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I had, a, I had a lot less gray hair back then. Okay, so what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to first start off by asking uh, Ken about his background prior to his studying economics. So what were you doing? What was interesting you before economics came into your life? Interestingly enough, from my point of view, I was very a, a strongly a science buff. I was getting a minor in physical science and a major in biology at San Jose State. And, uh, and I had the opportunity to actually go to medical school through the military where I got my 91 B20 degree. And I found out very, very quickly, I just don't like sick people. So <laughs> I thought this is not a good idea for me to stay in medicine, although I had to practice for six years in the military. Oh. When I came back, back in those in the 70s, we were just get, going off the gold standard. And uh, as a scientist, where one, one plus one is always two, I thought if we went off the gold standard that, uh, that our dollar certificates were no longer redeemable and hard metals, that the value of the dollar would go to zero. And so I said, what are we going to do? So I decided to take some econ courses. Um, and after my first two econ courses, which I did not do very well in because it just didn't add up, it was chaos, I was still found it very, very intriguing. And I kept pursuing my studies and then, and then I think it was two or three years later, I actually had a master's degree before I finally understood this stuff. I hope you as students can, under, can quickly pick this up a lot faster than I did, but then I was hooked. This is a very fascinating topic, and economics is the only discipline I know <clears throat> that really unravels the massive complexities of how the exchange takes place between dollars, and in some cases, precious metals, in some cases not, employment, interest, and all those things which we find mysterious. So it was, it was the finance angle that really interested you or got you hooked on economics? Well, it, it, that's an interesting question. It was way more than finance. It was the social interaction. Uh -huh. I was thinking, what is going to happen to society when our dollars are worthless? How are we going to find employment. If we get employed, how are we going to get paid? Certainly not in terms of dollars because they have no value. And those were central questions to economic stability, social stability, and what was going to happen to my future. So you kind of found out that there was just more involved in it than just finance. What I found out is, is that social questions are very complex. Oh. But what is special about economics is that it has a special insight that no other discipline has. I listen to social scientists and political scientists. They understand that point of view from their point of view, but it's always far too narrow. Without, without economics, you're never going to understand just how complex these issues are. I, I'm reminded of Stalin's daughter who has a PhD taught at Harvard history for years and years, and somebody who is very closely akin to the, to the major political machinations during the World War II period and thereafter. She said, wars are never ideological. Wars are always economic. Mm. And I just think since that time, I've been uh, forever intrigued by this, by this field, which sheds light on these social problems in a way that no other field can, in my opinion. 
maybe you could uh, remind some of our students who Stalin was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be difficult for me to believe that people do not know about Joseph Stalin, Stalin but uh, according to some sources, he was responsible for more deaths than uh, Hitler. He apparently was responsible for over 12 million executions. And, uh, and that's, if you're going to take social science, you're going to take political science, he is definitely worthy of some study uh, for a lot of reasons. If, yeah, if and not, economics is definitely one of them, right? <laughs> and economics is one of them. But also, I think that to be fair is fair. I think social science may have an awful lot to say about his actions more than economics. The economics has, has, its, has its contributions, but it's, but it's not limitless. And so we also need social science, too. So you're, you're, you're basically describing a, a discipline that you've discovered that has a, a lot of layers to it. If you, did you find one particular economic concept that was really like resonated with you, kind of made you really want to learn more? Well, for me, it was the financial aspect, as I mentioned before. But if we're uh, sort of jumping ahead, what I find gets the interest of my students are those issues that affect them personally each and every day. But it took me a while to find out just how it was. It's a lot of these economic issues uh, were so or should be so personal to each student. Um, I have over the last 30 years personally pursued the accumulate without a knowledge of economics, but the principles really aren't that complex on a personal level. Uh, we have what's called Keynesian fiscal policy, which is simply the idea that you've got to promote growth through expansionary monetary policies. And that means producing an increase in money supply about three, three and a half percent per year, which is quite variable. But from my point of view, and you do your own research, builds in inflation. So um, you really need to do certain personal things, which if, if you're in my course, I'm very happy to share you with. That if you get on this very simple model, you should be a multimillionaire within 20 years. And it's, it's not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. And it's based upon inflation. Um, and we, we, in my course, we'll spend many, many hours going over that. But you do your own, do your own research. And then, of course, in my course, if you find I'm, I make a mistake in any area, you're welcome to go to your smartphones and you get immediately extra, you get extra credit for embarrassing the instructor because I want my game to move forward. And, and moving forward for me is, to, is for you to reveal any errors that I may have during my lecture period. Yeah, and how's I that, remember. How's I remember. That for, How's that for a pitch for my course? <laughs> and I remember uh, doing exactly that in your course. That was one, the first time I ever had a college instructor uh, challenge students in that regard to try to find the, the holes or errors. And it, it kind of uh, motivated me. So I'm sure it's done the same thing with other, other students. So I hope it, it continues. Hope it, yeah. hope, I hope it continues to do so. So, you, you know, you're hitting upon uh, students in your class and what you're doing to challenge them. What, what would you consider to be uh, their greatest takeaway or what would you want their greatest takeaway uh, from your class? Uh, you know, after they take it, what do you want them to understand and then apply? Well, there are several things, but a couple ideas come to mind. And one of them is this idea of opportunity cost. Students go into and they want to buy stuff. They want to buy a car. They want to buy a furniture. They want to buy items which I consider to be consumption items, which means when you buy them, their, their life is very, very truncated, three to five, seven years, seven years for foreign cars, three years for American cars is my, my joke. But, uh, <laughs> but you think when you buy your car for $50,000, it's a nice car. You think that uh, maybe you've made an investment. Maybe you have to have a car because you work. You think fifty thousand dollars make a hundred thousand a year? You think, well, that's a fairly safe purchase, but it's not, not at all. Mm -hmm. What you're forgetting is when you spend fifty thousand dollars on your car, or all the opportunities you could have exploited had you taken that same fifty thousand dollars and invested it in perhaps my favorite example is a house. So a ten percent down on a five hundred thousand dollar house, um, it means you get a Five hundred thousand dollar place, uh, and so that what we what we are going to experience, what you're going to see and do your own research, is an average inflation rate of about four percent per year. So your house goes up twenty thousand dollars a year on the five hundred thousand dollar place. 
So the $20,000, you think, oh, that's not much. And to realize, to make that $20,000, you only had to invest $50,000. So your return on investment, your ROI of $50,000 is 40%, 20,000 divided by 50. And when people talk about returns of one, two, three, four percent you know, I just shamefully say that that's ridiculous, bordering on stupidity. <laughs> so uh, the, the, uh, the, the, those are kinds of things that, that, I, that I have exploited and, and have accumulated a significant uh, portfolio as a result of those kinds of observations. So in summary, then, I want students to understand and we'll spend many, many hours <clears throat> looking at the various kinds of examples of what real costs are, and those real costs are what I consider to be mostly opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get lost in present value and future value and taking exponents and dividing by large numbers because you'll lose the message. I always want to summarize and come away with the central concept. The central concept of opportunity cost refers to what you could have had had you taken some other uh, investment opportunity rather than by consumption items whose in, in value is always zero. Okay. Yeah, I could tell that you're uh, rather passionate about this, this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, when, when years ago, when I was just, I graduated from uh, college, I graduated during a, a recession. And I always tell my, my joke is the, the only benefit of, with an, of, of an economics degree uh, when you gr graduate into a recession is you know why you're unemployed, right? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't do you any good, but it, it, you know why. But the the one the first job I took out of college was a salesperson. I commission only sales, right? And I quickly discovered that one of the effective tools for sales is enthusiasm. If you're enthusiastic about something, people are naturally drawn to you, and it's easier to it's easier for you to persuade them to convince them, right? And I definitely <laughs> see or hear the enthusiasm in your voice when you talk about economics, and I would be very interested to know what you consider to be the most thrilling uh, aspect of economics for you personally. That's a great question, and I'm very, very, in, I'm very enthusiastically want to answer it. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate, I feel, in having left medicine, uh, where I had to deal with people who always were just complaining. <laughs> so, <laughs> and got into a field which every single day, without exception, I walk into class able to take my, my economic training, my economic tools, which I want to share with my class, and analyze the week's events. Uh, and since the week's events change continually, every day I'm challenged and I'm entertained by a new set of ideas, a new set of challenges, which I enthusiastically share with my class to this day. I've been doing this now for counting the university level where I was teaching at 25 and I'm now 75. So I've been doing this for 50 years. And I think I'm more uh, excited, um, uh, more enthused than I was on the first couple of years of my teaching. My first couple of years of my teaching, I just would try to teach the principles. Hey, this is what's in the book. I'll make the book understandable. <clears throat> and now I'm not so uh, um, so chained to those concepts. Mm -hmm. What I do now is say, this is what we're studying now. This is how it applies to today's environment. And I can do that pretty much without exception. And then for the students who, who are prepared, you know, who do the, do the reading, do the mind tap program, which I suggest strongly and do all the, the other uh, ancillaries that I've recommended are able to grasp those ideas and carry those tools with them the rest of their life. As I point out, I'll give very simple formulas. If you do exactly what I say for 20 years and stay healthy, you'll be a multimillionaire uh, just on a part-time basis by following these rules. Oh, okay. And, you know, you, you, you touched upon the, the, the time you've spent doing this since you're 25. Um, and I think, some people may ask, given the 50 years you've spent in economics, uh, have you lost some interest in the discipline or is, has something kind of uh, um, gone a little stale? I mean, I'm trying to get a little real about, you know, studying about anything. You know, it, 
some people, when they look back, it, it, it means something different to them after a lifelong you know, in, engaging in a subject like that. So uh, do you find yourself getting a little um, losing interest, so to speak? You know, under, under perhaps under normal circumstances, in any other discipline, I think that's a good thesis, but not in economics. Uh, again, I, I am, and I devoted my last 10 years to helping students, and particularly those who are, who are trying. If, if, you, if you don't try, then um, you can just die, and I don't care very much. But if you, if you show me that you're trying to get ahead, you want to improve your life, and you can carry with it a strong set of ethics, morality, then I can show you how to become very successful financially, and how can you get tired of helping people? Helping people is a it's some reward, and uh, and to see my students being successful um, is just makes me very very happy. And uh, parenthetically, I typically get when I'm in a face to face environment, I get about two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year uh, in scholarships from my students, uh, not mm -hmm. not from me personally, but as a result of me guiding them through the scholarship um, uh, pathways so they're successful. And of course, there are certain criteria. I mean, if you're a B student in Chabot College, you're not going to do very well. If you're 4.0 and you have both a math degree and a computer science AA uh, and an AA in economics, then, uh, then I probably can help you uh, uh, with a great deal of financial assistance and or grants, rewards, and so forth. So you have to be an excellent student because be going to a community college puts you at a disadvantage because they know about great inflation. But I'm very, very happy to do that for my motivated and talented students. Yeah, and just to reiterate, the, the, that A student is going to be able to take advantage of the, of the scholarship angle of it, but the, a B student definitely still can get a lot of out of the class, right? Well, I don't want to name names. My only multi, multi millionaire, in one case, a billionaire student, barely could pass my course <laughs> and, and could never pass algebra. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this student did not take my advice whatsoever and sold his portion of his company for $1.2 billion. And again, I don't want to name names, but the person was not academically. Um, gifted whatsoever but he had total focus work seven days a week 12 14 hours a day and uh and he it was very very successful <laughs> and that and that goes to your comment you made about trying right you you gotta you gotta get up there get up to the plate right uh, was it was it woody allen who said that 70 percent of success is just showing up right is you gotta uh, you gotta <laughs> if you you know if you don't get out, out there and do it you're not going to reap any rewards right yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think you've got to step up to the plate, but step up to the plate and knowing who the pitcher is, how the game is played, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and with and with good preparation, otherwise you're going to strike out. Yeah. So I, many of my students try to go into fields, music and arts and and, uh, and athletics, thinking they're going to become professionals. I think you've got to become somewhat realistic. And, and my, my game plan for students to be successful, it's really straightforward. It's pretty simple. There's some simple rules to follow, some simple um, uh, financial guidance, and you will be successful. But you can build in some buffers, build in some, some safety aspects. But, um, but my model is simple. It's not complex. And, then you, and, and also the model I develop for each student, um, and each one's different because depending upon your skill set, you can show it to anybody you want. It's not a secret. I, I'll share with anybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but the greater skill set you have to begin with, the more chances you are of being successful more quickly. Yeah, I, I would agree. Boy, so it sounds like um, students have uh, uh, everything to gain, nothing to lose, so to speak. Uh, taking economics, right? <laughs> well, going back to opportunity cost, um, if you take my course and you're there three hours a week, then you could have been doing something else. But um, speaking from from uh, from my heart, you, I don't think you student could spend their time uh, uh, better than spending three hours in my course per week. <laughs> so right. I think they'll use their time efficiently. Well, I think that that really brought it back back home to where we started too, in terms of your most valuable uh, uh, insight to economics and what it motivated you and to what you think is going to be the biggest help to your students. So, okay. Well, I think that uh, I think students should take a lot 
from what you said, given all the years experience you have uh, teaching this and at Chabot too. I, I don't think, you know, you've been solid at Chabot for how many years now? Well, I think I have, I spent 44 years at Chabot alone. I taught for, I think four or five years before that. So pretty close to 50 years. I've taught at Kenyatta, West Valley, San Jose State for two years. Um, I think it's pretty close to 50 years, one way or the other. Uh, I, I, I do know that when I first started, I did see the Egyptian pyramids being built. So. <laughs> and I think they're done now. So, <laughs> okay. I think, the, I think the students are going to get a lot out of um, all of this and um, hopefully they'll be, um, no, not hopefully they will be encouraged to explore the, our hub uh, to get a, a little more information in terms of what they can get out of taking economics classes at Chabot. And I think this, this conversation alone it should be, su should suffice, but there's going to be more, right? Yes. But th thank you very much. Thank you for having me on Martin. Okay. That's all for now. Bye-bye.